Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Brookings. I'm Mike O'Hanlon with the Foreign Policy Program. Today I have an uh, amazing uh, honor to interview Congressman Adam Smith, not so much about the things we've talked about before. And I've learned a lot from him in the past, and we've all benefited from his role and his continued role in service to the country in the uh, U.S. Congress, where he's been ranking member, still is today, and also chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, various other assignments, subcommittees, uh, worked a great deal on issues in intelligence, foreign affairs, also been instrumental in focusing on America's middle class. If you look at his political priorities, these are the things that have mattered most to him. Within the Pentagon debates, he's often been associated with a, a person who prioritizes military families, taking care of them, but also making sure they have good equipment at good cost, being a responsible steward of the taxpayer's money. And all that continues. But when I talked to him about these things in the past, little did I know the other contribution he still had to make uh, to our national debate. And you can now see it, and we'll be uh, signing books and, and selling them afterwards if you can stay. Lost and Broken, My Journey Back from Chronic Pain and Crippling Anxiety. I think it's amazing that a public figure of his stature and of his importance would be so open and honest and direct and educational about these experiences, and that's what we're here to talk about today. So thank you for coming, and please join me in welcoming Congressman Adam Smith. So there's so much to talk about, uh, Congressman, but I thought the most natural thing was just to ask you to maybe begin with a little bit of an overview of your progression, your chronology, your life, really. And I don't want to ask you to tell that whole story in one response to one question. Sure. So I thought a way to frame it and then just ask you to, you know, pick up where you think it's most informative and most instructive is to say that in reading your book, I noticed there were three moments in your life that you identified as sort of crisis moments as the onset of a phase of either anxiety or pain or both. And then those were 1991 interestingly, right after you had won your first uh, public office in Washington State. And then in 2005, when, as you say, life's feeling pretty good, you got a wife and young kids, you're doing well in Congress, uh, you know, it's a tough time for the country with Iraq and everything, but a lot of things are going pretty well for you, and all of a sudden you feel this anxiety. And then in 2016, and then you talk about two long stretches of relatively good years, uh, although, you know, you point out even during those there were stresses and difficulties, from roughly that first crisis or shortly thereafter through 2005, and then basically for most of Barack Obama's presidency up until about 2013, maybe starting in a couple of years before that, 2007 to 2013, you, you describe as a good six-year run. Anyway, I'm sorry for the long introduction, but I wanted to just get those markers on the table and ask you to pick up your story with whatever part you think is the best way for us to understand you, and then we'll wind up getting to the discussion of which therapies worked, what lessons you think we can draw later on in the hour. Sure. Well, I think the easiest way, way to think about it is, you know, I reached that crisis point, and I start the book in 2016 when actually I had been um, battling anxiety at that point for three years and chronic pain for two years, and I'd been through three different surgeries. I view that as, uh, well, as the chapter of it says, rock bottom. That was like... <laughs> thank goodness, um, was the absolute low point of it. And then how did I get there and how did I get out? That's the easiest way to think about it. And both of those things were, were really important, sort of thinking back through it. And there were challenges and problems that I had throughout my life, both in terms of pain and in terms of mental challenges. And my general philosophy up to that point um, in 2013 was, we're just going to, we're going to push on through it. Okay, I you know, and and that's not a bad thing, by the way. Um, to as an approach, if you have pain or stresses and strains in your life, you know, just you know, keeping going is a very initial, you know, positive way of looking at it. It beats the alternative of simply quitting and stopping. Uh, but then you have to understand those points when you can't just keep going anymore. When it, when it's worth it, and I think this is true in everything we're trying to do. You know, maybe you need to pause and sort of think about, okay, what do I fundamentally need to fix here? And I think the biggest thing that I try to get across here is just the complete cluelessness that I had around the whole mental health picture. 
I had been struggling with physical problems since I was well, 12 years old when a bone died in my right knee and then I had surgery. And I'd always kind of been thinking about it incorrectly, it turned out, in, in many, many way, many respects. But I had been at least trying. Um, you know, but mental health-wise, I just sort of assumed that that wasn't a problem. And I, I describe this, and I think this is a really important way to think about it. You know, for me, mental health was very simple. Either you were normal or you were crazy. And at some point in my life, I decided that I was normal. So cool, I don't think about that anymore. Um, you know, I mean, and, and I think that's a natural way to sort of approach it. So when those things hit you, like in 91, when that bout of depression hit me, um, you know, I, A, didn't have any idea what I was dealing with, and B, didn't think of it as something that I had to deal with. I just had to sort of mm, get through it. Um, so it's really important to think in those terms, to think about, okay, what, what is necessary to get to good, good mental health? And I think the final thing I'd say, you know, well, two things. Let me get you up to 2016 and then just briefly sort of how, why I wrote the book and how I got, got better is it's also important to draw a distinction between sort of the normal ups and downs of life, stress, strain, good days, bad days, and then a clinical problem. And there is a big difference, you know, and when I encountered a lot of people and I would tell them about my anxiety, it's an oversimplification, but a lot of people, well, well, why are you anxious? And I would say, that's actually not really the point. I don't know exactly. I mean, I got things I'm worried about, but is that the reason that I'm this anxious? You know, it, it's a different thing. And, and, and just to be clear here, even if you don't have clinical anxiety or clinical depression, you can still have mental health challenges that you need to address. If you're struggling to deal with stress, if you're struggling to deal with a period in your life that has you feeling, you know, unhappy, for lack of a better way to put it, those are things that there, there are things you can do to help deal with those challenges as well and things you need to think about. If it crosses over into that level of clinical anxiety or, or clinical depression, then you got a bigger problem that, that you need to really take a look at. And that's what hit me. I tried to describe it, you know, the depression I had, it was just this, this utter blackness about everything. And my life was really good at that particular point. I won't get into too many of the details on that, but 25 years old, I got elected to the state senate after a whole lot of struggle, frustrations, all kinds of stuff. All of a sudden, the world was right there for me. And for some reason, I was just, you know, and I couldn't, nothing sort of made me happy. It's, it's a deep-seated thing inside of you that needs to be looked at more closely and in more depth, which we'll, we'll talk about more, more in a little while. So as the, the stuff was hitting me in 2013, I am an excessively logical person. And I was like, all right, I'll think my way through this. I'll, you know, my, my therapists at the time, they used to get these epic emails from me <laughs> in which I, were both physical and mental, I'd go through, okay, well, we tried this, and here was my reaction, and I took this pill, and that happened, I took that pill, and this happened, I did this exercise, that, and it'd, it'd be like, <laughs> you know. So I, you know, when I, when I was getting through this in 2019, after I, you know, was in the middle of my three and a half years of psychotherapy with a psychologist who actually, well, I would say actually knew what he was doing, which is a little bit more pejorative than I mean it to be, but not that far off. He helped me, and then I found my muscle activation therapist, so I was getting better, and the thought occurred to me, I could really benefit from right now, while all this stuff is relatively fresh in my mind, going through, in my obsessively logical way, what I learned. Um, and that's why I sort of put it, put it together, and that's how I tried to pull through the whole thing. Not meant to say that, you know, everyone had the same experience, but it's, it's an example, a case study. So if you're dealing with these things, or frequently if it's someone in your family or someone close to you is dealing with these things, that can give you at least some parameters of, of the challenges that they're trying to work their way through. I really like the way that you were willing to be critical of the mental and physical health care systems of the United States, but at the same time, you didn't make them your scapegoat. You said, we as individuals need to do the best we can to understand our own problems, our own diagnoses, not that we're making the diagnosis or you know, finding the therapy on our own, but we need to be aware, critical thinkers throughout that process. And also we need to realize these problems are complicated. And so we should expect the search for solutions to be sometimes longer yeah. than you wish. Well, and that's what they, 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 there is no, no magical solution. And, and sadly, as an individual, you do have to take responsibility for trying to figure that out. Um, and, and that really sucks, particularly when you're in, in, a, in a vulnerable place. 
you know, I, 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 I'm having trouble taking responsible, responsibility for feeding myself. Um, how am I supposed to figure this out? But the sad part of it is, ultimately, that's, it's going to have to be there. No one's going to come up to you and go, here's what you need to do. You're all good. You, you have to think through it. And in fact, particularly on the mental health side, one of the three or four keys that I like to try to tell people is you have to be honest with yourself about what's really going on with you now and in the past, because we all lie, okay? And we all lie to ourselves. Some people are like, well, I never tell them. Yeah, that's just not the way the world works. I mean, and, and by the way, some of those lies aren't bad, okay? You know, you got to get through the day. Um, you got to survive your job, your relationships, everything else. And if you got to, like, kid yourself and say, okay, this really, I, I'm really more okay with this than I really think I am. That's not a bad thing, all right? But it can be a bad thing if you bury things in your life that are really, really troubling you that you've never adequately dealt with. And I put them into two broad categories. One, think, well, regrets, broadly speaking, but things that you're angry about, things that happened in a relationship or happened to you at some point that you don't think was fair and it was never adequately dealt with in your view. Uh, rightly or wrongly, if that's the way you look at it, you need to be aware of it. But the second piece that people don't talk about as much, and what was really helpful in writing this book, is things you feel guilty about. Things that you did that you just feel like were just wrong, and you just, you know, you feel responsibility for it that you've never adequately dealt with. Um, You really have to be honest with yourself about that. And it can be something going on in your life right now, okay? Or it can be something that happened anywhere, in childhood or elsewhere. And that's where being able to be honest with yourself. And those are the things that sort of dig down into your psyche and produce anxiety and depression that seems unrelated to a specific cause, which is why psychotherapy is so incredibly helpful in that situation. So I want to ask you to talk a little about what techniques have worked for you the best. And it's striking you, I think you said you've seen over 100 people combined in mental Most health. Most of those were on the physical side. Yeah. There's only about a dozen psychiatrists and psychologists. The world of physical therapy is like, <laughs> and Michael, I think you only introduced me to half of them. So, <laughs> yeah, so there's quite a few of them out there. Yeah. So actually, before I get to the mm. therapies that worked, in the, let me ask this question. For your whole experience, what was more challenging the anxiety or the physical pain or the interaction between the two as well as the meds of the two? Ah, that's a good question. I don't think I could divide. I think, I think all three were combined. I, I would, yeah, anxiety, actually, clearly, number one, because that, that impacts your ability to deal with anything else uh, without, without any question. I mean, for me, it's hard to separate them in my mind because the pain made me anxious and the anxiety also caused some pain. So it's hard to separate them. But yes, without question, I would say anxiety because that just impacts everything. My, my thing is I think. I love thinking. Anxiety robs you of that because everything is right here in the moment. You cannot, you know, my always way of approaching that was if there's something that's gnawing at me, I must resolve that before I can move on to something else. I couldn't resolve this. Okay, so I couldn't move on to something else. So, yes, I would say the anxiety was was definitely the overarching factor. So I want to come back to 2016. I still can't believe how effective you were in Congress during that period when, you know, Mac Thornberry came here a lot in in those years when he was chairman and watching you two in action, the defense bills you produced, I'm still just blown away that you were able to do that when you were at rock bottom, as you put it in your own words. But And that was before you found many of these uh, solutions or partial solutions or call them what you will, uh, but among that group would be cognitive behavior therapy for addressing your fears, uh, muscle activation therapy for your physical ailments, the, the, the hip replacement surgeries that were ultimately successful but in the short term caused a lot of pain and anxiety, if I read you right, and, and then thinking of therapy as something, that, as you say, that helps you address your past in a way that processes your guilt and your anger, uh, your anger towards yourself but also towards others, and think of it not as a way to get those thoughts or that past out of your life or out of your mind, but to be able to just process it. Am I, am I right? Is that sort of the beginning of a short list of what works I mean, for you best? 
I would would put it in this order because there was one big key thing at the start of it that I was that I was missing and wasn't getting from uh, the therapist that, that created a challenge before I could get into the cognitive behavioral therapy and even the psychotherapy. But I put it in, in this basic order. Um, number one, you need to have a sense of your own self worth, and and that's what I was missing and what didn't make sense to me. We kept sort of pulling apart. You know, well, what are you anxious about? Uh, why are you anxious? You know, walk through all that. It's like, yeah, I could walk through it. I mean, I'm worried about my health. I'm worried about my job. I mean, all basic stuff. But, you know, why is it making me so anxious? Um, and that is that inherent sense of self-worth. And that's what this, you know, therapist, um, psychologist who really helped me with. That's, I say this in the book. But the very first thing he said to me when I met with him was, you don't think you have the right to exist. And at the time, I thought... What the hell does that even mean, basically? That's, that's not helpful. And B, it's wrong. What do you mean? Okay, I, I, I'm a reasonably confident, successful person. Um, you know. So, And I walked through this argument with him, and it's really very interesting. I, 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 right in the moment, I said, like, let me tell you, I'm, here's a, I'm good at my job. I mean, my gosh, look at all I've accomplished. You know, I'm married. And he kept saying to me, so you think that's where your self-worth comes from, from, from your deeds, from what you've accomplished? And I'm like, yeah, there's another answer, okay? It really makes sense to me. But yes, there is another answer. And this is, you know, not to get a little Buddhist on you here, but we are all worthy of love simply because we exist. And if you don't understand that, you're in trouble. You can conceivably get around it, and I did get around it for a long time because I tried to accomplish things at a very high level so that every day I could go to bed confident and say, I'm okay. Look at all the stuff that I did. Look at where I'm at. Look at what I've accomplished. But you're really on a treadmill that's going to speed up until the point that it throws you into the wall. Because human being, I haven't met the human being who succeeds at everything on a day in. It just, you can't do it. It just doesn't happen. And if you believe that if you don't succeed, you're fundamentally unworthy as a person, yeah, that's a really, really stressful event to have to go through. So you have to understand your own self-worth. I also give one very helpful tip on this. To really get there, you have to believe in the self-worth of the people around you, okay? Because <laughs> that's the part can be can be really hard. If you think about, you know, particularly in the world of politics, we have, you know, disagreements on all manner of different things. You have to understand that it applies to everybody, everybody, even Donald Trump, okay? Just to throw it out there. Um, so that helps with that. That's number one. And then number two is really having that honest look at your life. And that's where psychotherapy can come in. You don't have to go to psychotherapy. If you have good, good friends that you can communicate with and talk about, if you're, you're willing to talk openly about the different relationships in your life. But it can be hard. Um, I use the example, you know, say you have a job that you can't leave. You need the job, all right. You really don't like it, but, you know, it pays the bills, all this other stuff. Or maybe, you know, you've got a friend there that you don't want to leave or something. And so you try to tell yourself, I love this job. This is great. And you really don't, okay? It creates tension. If you have a relationship in your life that you're hanging on to because you don't really want to, you know, deal with breaking it up. And so you kid yourself about how you really feel about that. Um, that can create tension for you to try to maintain that sort of internal lie. But the best sentence about psychotherapy, and this is the second piece after the self-worth, is the purpose of psychotherapy is not to correct the past. And that's one that I really struggled with because I wanted to be perfect, which meant that if I figured out I made a mistake, I got to go back and fix it. And you can't tell me that I can't fix it. Well, you can't. Okay. The purpose is to understand the patient's history and to grieve for what he has lost. And that is just a great sentence because you want to go back and understand this and you want to process it. And I know it sounds like some new agey thing that you have to have closure or process. You do. Okay. Whatever it is, you can get to that point. Actually, there's a bunch of studies right now that are really important about dealing with PTSD and other things and dealing with specific traumatic events. And this was something that someone told me about during the course of my journey here, that if you go back and relive the traumatic experience that you've had, that can be incredibly helpful. And there are various techniques now, hypnosis, EMDR. There's also a, a medication out there that apparently can really help you experience that. And once you've experienced that, tremendous relief. So that's the psychotherapy part. Um, got a couple other things that are extraordinarily long answer here, really but the last two are, are cognitive behavioral therapy 
And I shorthand, I say meditation. And what cognitive behavioral therapy does is it tries to teach you how to better process the information that's coming at you. And for the most part, for three years or so, cognitive behavioral therapy just really pissed me off um, because it kept telling me, okay, well, here's what you do. You make a list of all the things that you're anxious about, and then we'll talk through them, and we'll explain how you can do this, and then you can, like, not be as anxious about it. Well, if you did this, would you be less anxious? Sure, that's the whole scale of 1 to 10 thing, which also drove me insane. On a scale of 1 to 10, how anxious are you today? Well, what if I told you this? How anxious are you now? I'm like, well, I'm getting more and more anxious because I don't know what the right answer is. Um, (laughs) But... But it is helpful to think about those things. But if you've got those other issues, if you don't have that sense of self-worth, if you haven't dealt with the psychotherapy piece, you're just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic with cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, once you get those baselines, it can be really helpful. And also, the final piece of this on the mental health side that is really helpful is meditation. And I went through an epic battle with meditation <laughs> because I was, I was convinced that this is the thing that you have to do, right? This is, you know, you have to just put everything aside, put all thoughts out of your head, just sit there for 20 minutes, that clears your brain, presto, it's all good. Well, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of meditation. I paid $950 for, um, what do they call it? I can't remember what they call it now, but it's some specific type of med- meditation that you do, and they give you a mantra, and they go through all this stuff. Um, yeah, that's fine. Um, but here's, skipping all of that, the thing that I find useful about meditation is it can put into your, uh, your, your brain the idea that you don't have to chase every thought that you have, okay? And that's what was really helpful for me, and what I continue to do to this day is while I'm walking or brushing my teeth or taking a shower or whatever, I'll just say, okay, for the next couple of minutes, I'm just going to notice the world around me. I'm going to try to process it. I'm going to try to figure it out. I can try to solve anything. If a thought comes into my head, that's okay. The phrase is, notice it and let it go. And that is incredibly helpful because I used to think that I had to solve every problem before I could relax. If there was a problem in my head, I had to noodle it out, and then I could, well, you can't solve everything. And that's why the best way I also sum it up is, I don't think you actually asked me this question, but a lot of people ask me the question, what keeps you up at night? And I now have a standard answer to that, which is nothing. Okay, because it doesn't do any good, all right? Me staying up for another couple hours worrying about what's going on in Ukraine is not actually going to solve the problem. So I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to get up tomorrow morning while rested. Then I'm going to start thinking about it again, all right? Meditation can really help you do that. So that's what I say. You've got to have a sense of self-worth. You know, be honest with yourself. If that requires psychotherapy, fine. Use cognitive behavioral therapy to, to, to lessen the stresses and strains. and and meditate in some form so that you realize you don't have to solve every problem. Um, The physical side is simpler and easier to explain. Um, I spent all this time on my muscles and my body thinking that, you know, you got to be stronger, got to be more flexible, and then there's all kinds of things that can go wrong in here, okay? Like, you know, i got a knee problem, maybe I need surgery. You know, i got a foot problem, maybe I need surgery on that, you know, joints. And the one piece that wasn't being told to me until I came across the mu- muscle activation therapy people was that your muscles also have to be activated, all right? And if they aren't activated, you're compensating in a whole bunch of different ways that is putting a lot more pressure and pain on your body. Once they are activated then all of that is protected. That's what I try to point out. I mean, I have a lot of things physically wrong with me because of the knee surgery I had and the fact that I didn't rehab it. My body got out of balance. My hips were impinged. So that puts more pressure on my body. But if my muscles are working properly, it can deal with that. I mean, I used to have constant neck problems. You know, the muscle activation guys got me going. haven't had them for years. Um, You know, and then I get into the explanation of muscle activation techniques, which I, I don't do a very good job of explaining this because I don't know, a lot, a lot of people, a couple of people actually have taken me up on it and been, been happy about it. But so there are 43 distinct muscle patterns in your body, and they've determined this. So every move that you do is controlled by one of those 43 patterns. And those patterns occasionally shut down if you overstress the muscle or compensate, whatever. So what the muscle activation techniques people do is they put you up on a table and they check all of those different muscle patterns. So, yeah, I don't know. Usually the examples involve my legs and I'm not laying down on the floor. So um, basically, you know, do this. And they'll 
put their arm here, and if your muscle's working, you, you, if it's not, it doesn't matter. I mean, we're talking just tiny, tiny little amount of pressure. It's gone. But then they restart it. Uh, they've got an electromagnetic magnetic pulse now that restarts the muscle. Used to do it by um, massage. And the electromagnetic pulse story is actually kind of interesting because the guy who started this whole thing, whose name I don't actually know, um, out of Denver, still doing it, uh, got in a horrible car accident a few years ago. And as he was recovering, they used, you ever use a TENS machine, if you know what that is, where they like send a little pulse, and they were doing that to him. And it was shutting down his muscles. Um, so A, he asked them to stop doing that. Um, and B, he got to thinking, well, if there's a frequency that shuts down the muscles, might there be one that starts them up? And sure enough, after running through that whole little spectrum list, they found it. And it does. So now it just turns it on, muscles get back working. In my case, I had, I think, just about every single muscle pattern in my body shut down. So it took him, I don't know, six, seven months to sort of get them going again. And it took a little while, a little trial and error. But muscle activation, it is absolutely key to your physical health and to reducing chronic pain. Maybe not the only thing, okay? You know, if you got a herniated disc or a bunch of other things you could have that you will need to deal with. But muscle activation is always going to be necessary and in many instances can actually resolve problems that people say you need surgery for when you really don't. So to stay on the physical uh, rehabilitation part for a minute, by the way, I love your wit through the book, too. It's not all a heavy-duty read. There's a, definitely some joking around. I, I love your chapter, Everybody Knows a Guy. <laughs> and that helps explain how you saw 100 different people yes, yes. A, a, along the way. But you also have a little f- fun while showing respect to other methods of physical therapy. But you go through the list that makes it clear that you know there can be a little bit of a faddish quality to some of this. So oh, there's absolutely. the Bowen method. There's rolfing. There's dry needling, which you point out is just as painful as it sounds, and there's... Myofascial mu- release is yep. yeah, another one. I was yeah. going to try to say that. I'm yes. glad you did for me. Uh, so uh, how do these all fit together? How should they, are, are some of them more serious than others? Are some of them more scientific? Are they all sort of relatives of each other, and they're all progressing as the science is better known towards a good place together, or are some of them harmful in your experience? I mean, how would you place this in sort of a taxonomy? Well, I think that a lot of them use the idea of muscle activation. I mean, that's the idea behind dry needling for that point. Um, it, you know, you stick it in there and the muscle's going to activate. <laughs> and it does. I mean, that, that's certainly true. Hurts like holy hell, but it does, it does in fact activate the thing. And, and so, so I say that in the book, that all of these things contain a tiny little piece of a broader idea. But what the muscle activation techniques people have done is really dove into it and figured out, well, how exactly does this work, okay? You know, what are the muscles involved? How do you activate them? They even, really, it takes three times when they reactivate a muscle. They activate it, then they stress it so it shuts down, then they do it again, and after three times, it will stay on after it was shut down. I mean, they fought through all of this. So really, these methods are not terrible. Um, they're not that far off. And, and, and for a lot of people, that'll be fine. You know, you don't have any big, huge, serious problems. Your joints and body and twist it all over the place. Um, so it's helpful. And strength and flexibility matters. Um, in fact, the one I've never told my muscle activation guy this, but he does not believe in stretching, okay, at all. And I think he's kind of wrong about that, but it's really more a matter of what is stretching versus simply muscle movement, Okay, the idea, and this is what the myofascial release people do, and they may get upset at me, but you don't need to do it for two and a half hours. You're just hurting yourself if you're stretching for two and a half hours in all likelihood. Um, But after seven months of seeing him, I was a little tight in some places still, so I violated the rules, and I start doing like a little 12-minute stretching routine after I walk. I don't hold anything for longer than maybe five seconds. But basically, it's just moving your body in ways that it wouldn't ordinarily move more than stretching to make sure that it doesn't forget how to do that. But yes, I think, you know, and, and if something works for you, that's the other thing. You know, I, I don't mean to say, okay, this isn't ever going to work. Don't ever try it. If you try it and it works for you, God bless you, okay? Um, you know, this has to be an intuitive process, trial and error, learn as you go. I mean, if I believe in, in just one thing, it is the ability of human beings to adapt, learn, and get better. 
more than I believe in, here's how you have to adapt, learn, and get better. Just believe in the concept that you can adapt, learn, and get better. Do you have any observations or recommendations for the healthcare industry? I mean, you've, you've alluded to some of them, but I know you've got a, an executive summary in the book. Most of the book, by the way, reads just like a wonderful chronology. It's, it's his autobiography, in effect, with a focus on anxiety and chronic pain, but also with other parts of his story. But there's a beginning section where you write it like a policy wonk at Brookings, and you have seven lessons. And I wondered if you wanted to amplify any of those or share them in regard to what we need to fix in our medical and mental health care systems in the United States. Yeah, the big one for me is one that doesn't often get talked about, but you know, Malcolm Gladwell and Michael Lewis have both written books about sort of problem solving, for lack of a better way to put it. How, you know, how, do you get, how do you get results? How working with people, working with systems, how do you make them work better? And the healthcare system just, it doesn't take on complex problem solving particularly well, and ironically, they're in a situation where a lot of times that's what they're doing is complex problem solving. Um, and that's just not the way they're structured. It's not the way they think. It's not the way they communicate. In fact, I think it was a Michael Lewis book. I could be wrong. I get them mixed up. That talked about a hospital in Toronto that specifically hired someone to basically review cases, as, and this person was not a medical doctor, um, to review and sort of review them from that sort of more logical problem-solving approach. Because, again, this is not easy. I mean, you walk in there, any one of a thousand different things could be wrong with you. And it, 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 it takes a collaborative process. So I think they need to work better at educating people how to do that. And then access is, is a problem. You know, we have a patchwork quilt of, quilt of access. Maybe you have insurance, maybe you don't. Maybe you have insurance, but it isn't, this person isn't in your network. Maybe they don't take insurance at all, which, by the way, is the case with muscle activation techniques people. So broadening the coverage, but and I make this point in the book for those of us on the left side of the political spectrum, don't think that a single-payer system is some sort of magic solution to this. And I, and I worry, as we've seen this healthcare debate, that I, I frequently have people from the left when something comes up say, oh, if only we had health care should be free. If only we had a single-payer system, everything would be fine. Understand this. There is more demand for health care goods and services than there is money to pay for it. And that is true in every single health care system currently in existence or ever devised. Okay? It just is. We are going to have to make choices about what we will cover or not. As I did a podcast with a guy from Australia who was talking about this. And he said Australia has some decent upfront care, but you also have long waiting lists to get access to mental health. Or they'll see you four times and then you're off. So you're always going to be engaged in a very difficult rationing decision. I just think we still do it very poorly in this country, and it skews towards, you know, the only way you can basically be sure that you'll get whatever health care you need is to have a lot of money, which I didn't. Um, so, yes, access and then having a problem-solving approach, and then we haven't talked about the drugs yet. We are way too reliant on drugs. It, it almost pains me now to watch television just to watch those advertisements. Because they're advertising drugs like they're advertising frickin' Kool-Aid, all right? I'm dancing, I'm having fun because I'm taking this pharmaceutical and look at me, yeah! I'm like, really? That's how we're gonna make a decision on what sort of drug we're gonna pump into our body by who has the snappiest tune on their commercial? So, yeah, um, we, we could make a lot more logical choices about what medication does work. And I really wanna emphasize one point. I don't take any medications now. I'm incredibly happy after going through my clonazepam. By the way, that's one of the great things about doing the audio book. I learned that it's clonazepam, not clonazepam. Because when you do an audio book, they're like, I think you're pronouncing that wrong. You have to do it right. So I learned something. Um, so the benzodiazepines, obviously the opiates we've dealt with, there are other things as well. There are instances, I'm sure, when medications can be incredibly helpful to people both in pain and anxiety. We way overuse them and we rely on them. Um, and, it's, and frankly, that's as much the patient's fault as it is the healthcare system's fault. Because I've always felt this about advertisements. You don't have to go to Burger King just because they put a Burger King ad on television. And I really don't understand why people don't grasp this. Um, you know, so you don't have to do what they tell you in the advertisements. But the primary reason that patients do, and I know this was my case, I'm in incredible pain, anxiety. I, 
I don't know if I could go on for one more day. And if you can give me something that's going to fix it, I'm going to give it a shot. All right? Because frankly, what I did that ultimately fixed it was hard work. It took time. Okay? You know, you don't go to a muscle activation therapist once and then wake up the next day feeling great. It took a while. Okay? You don't go to a psychotherapist and have one 20 minute conversation and walk out feeling great. It takes time and you have to work at it. And if somebody comes along and says, hey, take these for a week, it's all good you're going to be really tempted to say yes. And particularly when you're dealing with anxiety, I'll give you this other warning. The antidepressants, the SSRIs, um, you know, Zoloft, Prozac, and all that, you know, it works for some people. I mean, it, it didn't work for me. In any, in it this doesn't even have any sort of initial thing. What I'm trying to get at is benzodiaphamines, I'm tempted to swear here, but I won't. They work. Okay. If you are suffering from severe anxiety, the odds are when you take that first benzo, oh, my God. Okay, and I'm not talking, you just feel normal. After all this time of constantly, constantly, you know, all, all of a sudden it's like, wow, all right? But sadly, it doesn't last. You build up tolerance fairly quickly, and there are probably side effects, and it really masks the problem. And that's the other thing about psychotherapy that I really want to emphasize. It's really good to expose that and get after the problem. But I remember in 2013 when I was having a conversation with one of the therapists that I wasn't actually seeing, but I just met through work, um, and was explained to me the, the process of suppressed issues, that you know, you've suppressed all this stuff. Because I kept saying, I'm 49 years old for crying out loud. You know, I made it this far. <laughs> okay, what the hell? Why now? Well, you know, you're suppressing stuff. And I said, okay, well, why can't I just suppress it for, I don't know, another 30 years or so and call it good? <laughs> All right? I mean, it worked just fine. The truth matters, it just, it pops up from time to time. Um, so, you know, so you, you, do, you do have to address those, those things, I guess, is, is the point that I'm saying. And the point about drugs is the other thing is I suppressed it for 49 years, and then I spent three years trying to drug it into submission, um, and that didn't work either. Uh, work for a you know, tiny little time frame. It's there. You've got to deal with it. But the positive note that I always like to end on is it can be dealt with. Because that was the other thing that really scared me. It's like, hey, you're going to say something to me, and all of a sudden I'm going to feel better? I mean, I understand if I am not in good shape, I do a bunch of exercises, my muscles get stronger, I get better. But what are you going to say to me that's going to make me feel better? I mean, I just didn't trust the process. Trust the process. Um, didn't work out for Philadelphia. Uh, that's a basketball reference, sorry. Um, but, you know, but it really does work if you stick with it in a way that suppression and drugs simply don't. I thought it was fascinating in the book, the way you talked about the different phases of your life and how you dealt better at certain phases than others, even before you had really figured out what was going to be your path ahead somewhere around 2019, right? 2018, 2019. Yeah. But you tried different things, and, and your challenges affected you to different degrees at different phases of your life, to some extent for reasons you can go back and identify, to some extent for reasons, like you said, that just sort of pop up. And I thought that was really one of the most engaging parts of the book was, was the way you did a nice job of saying you've always had some of these challenges, but, th but they would, you know, manifest themselves differently depending on what else you were doing in life. And, and it wasn't always within your control, but you needed to understand it. Yeah, and if I could, one very helpful thing that sort of helped me get through this was, um, and this is, again, one of my big themes, is that self-help works. You can get better. You have to take responsibility for it. I worry a little bit that too much of our, you know, there's a lot more public discussion in mental health. Even in the three years since I've written this book, it's become much more public. Uh, but I think a lot of it is just sort of voyeuristic, like, wow, look at how messed up that person is, um, you know, as opposed to, okay, what are we going to do about it, all right? And, and, and I don't want the message here to be if you have a mental problem, you know, just make sure everyone around you understands it, and that's just the way it is. There is a path to getting better. And again, I, I believe in the ability of people to get better. And I had this tremendous revelation when I was 18 years old as I was really frustrated, you know, life was not going the way it was. I was constantly, you know, angry about the fact that my life wasn't what I wanted it to be. Um, but 
I locked my keys in the car during a driving rainstorm up in Bellingham, Washington, and that anger was very much on the surface at that point when I finally paused and two incredibly helpful thoughts occurred to me. Number one, nothing bothers you unless you let it bother you. At the end of the day, it is a choice. Now, some of those choices are harder than others, believe me. I, I know the awful things that can happen in life, but you do have the ability to make choices about what you let bother you in life. And number two, I didn't want to be 40 years old and have a very solid set of reasons for why the world had screwed me and made me unhappy. I wanted to be 40 years old and be happy. So I was going to work towards that goal instead of working towards a solid reason for why I could feel sorry for myself. Now, having come up with those two revelations, it's not like, ah, yeah, no. Believe me, I backslid. <laughs> I backslid repeatedly over the course of the next decade or so uh, on that principle. But just having that idea in my head that there is a far higher degree of individual choice, number one, and number two, take responsibility for wanting to get where you want to get to. And that's a scary thing. It is. It's a scary thing to say, no, it's not somebody else's fault. It's not just that the universe worked against me. I'm going to put myself out there and accept the fact that I might succeed or might not succeed. Um, it's scary, but it is vastly better than just hiding back um, and deciding not to embrace it. So both of those things sort of helped me, even as I had not dealt with some of the more fundamental mental health issues that I later learned I needed to deal with. So I've got one more question for you, Congressman, and then we'll ask if folks in the audience have a couple, and then we'll make sure we finish by three or even a couple minutes before to start the book signing process. And, and by the way, if anybody wants to you know, exchange a quick word and just uh, thanks, we can do that at the table out front. Uh, so we'll maybe quickly move from here to that table in, in just a few minutes. But before we bring you all in, I wanted to start with this question that actually comes from audience questions that sent by email. And three of them, I think, had a specific focus on the men and women of the armed forces and their families. And a lot of what you've said would clearly be applicable. Take charge of your own health. Recognize your self-worth. Don't think of mental health as a stigma you can't talk about. A lot of those basic points apply to men and women in uniform and their families as well. But I wondered if you wanted to amplify or you know, individualize any of your advice for those who serve our country in uniform. Absolutely, and the one piece that I sort of brushed over and didn't get into is the trauma issue. Um, you know, and there's a lot of different things that can sort of cause you know you to have anxiety, as I mentioned, guilt, anger, regrets, a bunch of different things. But something that was really traumatic in your life um, is 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 a cornerstone piece, as I alluded to earlier. And if you don't address that trauma traumatic event. Um, it will eat away at you. And obviously, you know, service members who have had to deal with, you know, just, you know, horrific incidents on the battlefield, or even just, you know, I just had a newborn and I got deployed for a year. So I've abandoned my family for a year, even if you don't experience anything ter terrible. There's all kinds of issues that service members and their families, choices that they have to make between their duty to the service and their duty to their family that can be incredibly traumatic. And I think you know, a lot, and we're working on this a little bit within the uh, defense bill to try to, you know, get greater access to these treatments. As I said, there are a whole bunch of treatments out there now that help people explicitly experience that trauma and deal with it. Um, that you, and, and I will say there's some people who probably, not everyone who experiences trauma has this issue. Some people process it reasonably well when it happens and they're fine with it. Um, and if you're fine and everything, that's okay. All right, but if you are having issues of anxiety, depression, anger, difficulty in just, you know, living your life in a, in a normal way, it's worth it to examine that. And with our service members, there's obviously a lot of, of traumatic things that happen in their lives that, that they need to deal with. I do need to add that the other point that I mentioned in the book is I think a, one of the things that held me back, certainly, in terms of addressing my childhood and everything, was I didn't feel like I had experienced any trauma. I mean, I've seen people who've experienced trauma, okay? You know, if you're on the battlefield and you watch someone get killed right next to you, okay? You know, or if you were abused growing up or you had, or you were abandoned, you know? I, and I'm like, yeah, okay, I had an issue here, issue there, but that, that, nothing. Trauma doesn't have to be great. It just has to be something that in the moment that it happened to you, it traumatized you and you didn't deal with it and it's worth spending some time mm -hmm 
trying to figure out what those things are and adequately addressing them. But yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities now to really help with PTSD and a lot of people who are working on it. Um, and we need to really, really make sure those services are available um, to the armed forces. By the way, I, yeah, a footnote to that, I'm sorry, and then I'll go to audience questions. Is there enough capacity within the military mental health care system to be responsive? And if not, do we, are we doing enough to enlarge that capacity or make private resources more easily available to people who really need them, both for military, active duty, and reserve, as well as the veterans community? Yeah, no, we that that again is is an access issue, and it's an emphasis issue too. I mean, for a long time, it was like you know that's part of what it means to serve in the military. You don't have issues; you suck it up and you do the job and you move forward. Um, so, making sure that there's space for that because it, it makes people more productive and better at their job if they better deal with these issues. So, please, uh, if you wouldn't mind waiting for a microphone and identifying yourself, we'll start with the gentleman in the next to last row. Yes. All right, well, thank you for coming and uh, speaking today, sharing a little bit of your insight. Um, just had a, uh, my name's Owen Fisher. Um, so if you had to go back and you were having a conversation with yourself at 20 years old, what's some piece of advice you would share to that young man? Yeah, I think the biggest piece of advice is what I said earlier, um, is the two things. One, understand the choices that you have in your life and try to make the, the, the best choices possible. And then also, you know, like I said, figure out what you want out of life and, and, and try and pursue it. Um, and, you know, those are two big, big lessons. I think being young can be a really frustrating thing because you're trying to figure the world out, all right, trying to figure out your place in it. Um, understand the, the choice and understand the fact that you can have more affirmative impact on that than you may realize. The final big piece of advice is really have empathy for the people around you and listen to them. Now, I usually get that question within the context of, I want to get involved in politics, I'm 20 years old, what, what do I do? And I always use the line, selling is listening. And I think when you're a young person, there's this presumption that you have to prove yourself. And that the main way you can prove yourself is by explaining to other people how you really understand what's going on. Now, I think in the world of politics, that's my field. But whether you're going into business, whatever it is you want to go into, right away you want to establish with people that you know what's happening. Um, when, in fact, there's incredible strength in listening to the people around you. And that will get you farther. This is what I discovered when I was doorbelling. When I first started doorbell, I outlined this in the book for myself. I was petrified of the concept. So I just walked out the door and just started knocking on doors. You know, just, and I thought initially, all right, look, I'm 23, 24 years old at the time. Who's going to believe me? But as I really quickly learned, what people want to know is that you're going to be willing to listen to them and learn from them. And I think that can help you in so many different places because that desire when you're young, and I felt it. It's like, you don't think I know anything. Well, let me tell you. I do. I know it. It's like, and, that, and it's there. And that, but listen, selling is listening. I always say it's the truest thing anybody's ever said to me. Excellent. Up here, oh, we'll stay back in the back row with Courtney. Um, so I'd like to go back to earlier when you were talking about this like real paradigm shift that you had where you realized that your worthiness to love and your self-worth was innate. Um, and I was wondering if you t could talk a little bit more about how that affected the way that you approach work and the things that you were willing to prioritize professionally and personally. It took the pressure off. I mean, the, the way I really describe it, because one of the things that I worried about as this whole conversation was going on was, okay, you're telling me I have to basically be a fundamentally different person and fundamentally look at the world differently. Okay, and there's two problems with that that most people will normally have. Um, one is they're afraid of it. It's like, okay, I'm kind of, I'm kind of struggling here, but on the other hand, this better the devil you know, right? Okay, this is who I am. You're telling me I got to be somebody different, uh, but in my case, it was particularly problematic because I had succeeded quite well um, by being that person. And if you take this away from me, if you take that motivation, you know, what's going to happen? But what I learned was it didn't take the motivation away. And, and the 
best quick way I can sum it up is even after this, in 2019 was right when I became chairman of the committee. It was a fascinating period for me because I'm just coming out of it, all right? And I'm mid-chairman. I, I still, I'm still in a lot of pain, particularly early 2019. I'm still taking drugs. I got off of them officially in April of 2019. How am I going to run this committee and get through that whole thing while, you know? But what I found was I'm still every little bit as obsessive and focused and everything, but I do it all, and this is the key sentence, without the anger and self-flagellation, okay? You know, I don't get as angry, you know, I'm so, I prefer passionate, you know. I've had some conversations with people along the way that might be described as a little bit passionate, but it's not that same sort of anger, of frustration, of, you know, I'm gonna, fa- and also, I don't beat myself up over it. And, and, and that's the thing that I, I say in the book. After I had that conversation with the psychologist, and he said, you don't think you have the right to exist. And I was like, eh, eh. every morning when I woke up during the course of this, the first thing I said was, I hate myself. And the reason I said that is because I was failing. Okay, and failure to me was just, I wasn't meeting my responsibilities, and I just focused that all in on myself. I hate myself. That's the way I felt about it. You can be successful without that level of anger and self-flagellation, and that's really what the revelation gave to me was I don't have to prove myself every second of every day, and I don't have to prove myself to some impossibly high level, okay? So when I fail, and I do, um, it's okay. A lot more okay than it used to be. And that just helps me focus. It doesn't take away the desire to do better. It's not like I go, ah, I don't care, I failed. Yeah, screw it. Yeah, it happens. No, I think about it. I'm like, hmm, yeah, hell, wish I hadn't done that. Um, what can I learn from this? Um, so that, I think, is the biggest way that that revelation helped me, is just to bring a greater sense of overall peace. It doesn't stop me from wanting to work hard. Um, it just takes the pressure off. Come back here to the second row and then over here next. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Congressman. My name's Eric Woodby, and I'm currently interning on the Hill. And I'm curious about what your thoughts on the backlash of the normalization of mental health awareness. When I was in college, I worked for a mental health awareness organization, and I saw very often that young people were normalizing mental health to the point that they were identifying themselves with their mental health issues. And so I saw people develop this defeatist mentality of, yeah, I have anxiety, but there's no shame in that. It's just who I am. And then they become dependent on their drugs and dependent on their healing processes that they don't think it's something that they can overcome. And I'm curious if you had the same identification issue and this defeatism and what you think policymakers should consider with this issue in mind. Yeah. And that's the question that can get me in a whole heck of a lot of trouble here. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and answer it honestly. Um, it is really important that we start to talk more openly about mental health. Okay, and we have. That's one step. In and of itself, it is not sufficient. It doesn't really help anything. In fact, in some ways, it can have the opposite effect. Okay, so you got to talk about it. It's number one. Second thing you have to do is you have to understand, as I said at the outset, the difference between a clinical problem and just the normal stresses, strains, ups and downs of life. Both need to be dealt with, particularly when you're younger. Okay, you know. Because you can over, particularly in our society that you all have to grow up in now where everything's right there, and it's like, oh, my God. You know, you, you, know, you have to learn how to deal with that. That's not the same thing as having clinical anxiety or clinical depression. If you're stressed about a test that is coming up, that doesn't mean that you have a mental health problem. Okay, It means that you have to better process how you handle stress, and there's all kinds of different ways to, to deal with that. But then the second piece of it, how to say this exactly. Um, you can't use it as an excuse, all right? You can't use it as an excuse to simply not do anything and, you know, expect that the rest of the world is supposed to take care of you. And this is the part that's going to get me in trouble, okay? Because, look, and I, you know, I've been there, and I, you know, I, I have, you know, there are times when you're like, I just, I wish someone would just do everything for me. Okay, that, that's a feeling. 
But if too many people start doing that, you sort of run out of everyone's to do something for you. All right? So what I want to do is I want to teach people how to learn from this and be productive and be effective. And the other two really important points on this, as I keep saying, I powerfully believe in the ability of people to get better, adapt, and learn. Okay? Every day you have the ability to make yourself better. All right? And I believe that leading a healthy, productive life is what makes us most human. But the key thing to remember on this, it will rarely be your first inclination to do the thing that is going to make you more active. All right? And what I mean by that is, I think most people would describe me as a somewhat type A person. Go, 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 go. All right? But if I sit down on the couch and I think of two examples, one is on your typical Sunday afternoon where in this beautiful country that we live in, you could literally go from 10 a.m. to 10 p. No, 8 p.m. on the West Coast and never do anything but watch football all day long in the fall, which is just a beautiful thing when you combine it with fantasy football and all manner of other things. And that is kind of my inclination. And if you ask me at 12.45 as the morning games are wrapping up what I want to do, what I want to do is I want to keep sitting here and watch the 1 o'clock games, all right? Okay, but, you know, maybe I should go exercise. Maybe I should take my kid to the park back in the day when they were younger. Um, all banner, the, it is never your first inclination to do that, all right? So I think a lot of people think, well, I'm just different. I just, I'm just not motivated. We're all not motivated from time to time. You have to actively work to get motivated. And if you take it and go, well, gosh, I just, I just have these problems that make me different from other people, so I just can't get up. Everybody feels that. The other example I have is I don't spend a lot of time online, mainly because I'm sort of a late adapter and I can't figure that stuff out. But, you know, I need to check my email. So I'll check my email. And I guess it's something I really need to do. And then I'm like, okay, I'm sitting down and I'm in front of my computer. Well, I'll just check ESPN. I'll check ESPN. And then I don't need to look at this stuff. But if you ask me in that moment, what do I want to do? I want to keep sitting here. I'm comfortable. This is kind of, you know, I don't want to get up and, and go for a walk or go to the grocery store or mow the lawn or even meditate or whatever. And I worry a great deal that we've gotten this impression out there that, you know, if you, doing things that are difficult is not bad. You know, you have to learn how to be uncomfortable, not to think that you're going to create this world where I'm never uncomfortable. That's my goal. No, it's not your goal. Your goal is to better deal with being uncomfortable and figure out how to get past it. So all of those things are necessary, okay? And if all we do for mental health in this country is teach people to talk about it so that they get to the point where they're less willing to get up off the couch, then we've done an incredible disservice to people. Now, all of that said, here is the disclaimer, okay? I don't know what's going on inside of other people. And I think of the social anxiety that I had. And it literally was the case that in February of 1990, I'm like, if I'm going to win this race, i got to go knock on doors. I don't want to do that. I'm afraid, okay? So bleh, I just went out the door and started doing it. I know there are a lot of people out there who have a level of social anxiety that goes way beyond that to the point where, I mean, it's like stepping in front of a truck to think that you're going to go out and interact with people. And I urge those people to get help, to, to get care, and to figure that out, all right? But we have to be willing to differentiate. We have to be willing to try and do as much as possible because, again, the human inclination is not to do the tough thing, all right? And, and the tough thing sometimes cannot sound that tough. It's just you just don't want to do it. You have to get over that, to learn to be productive. Because on those days when I sit there and watch all those football games, I feel like crap the next day, all right? I just do. I mean, even if my team won, I feel terrible. If they <laughs> lost, then it's like, Ugh. okay. If I get out and I did something and balance, you know, I'm not, like, I'm not getting rid of the television, okay? I like entertainment. I'm going to watch it. I'm not getting rid of my phone or getting rid of a computer. You just have to learn how to balance those things. Very last question here in the second row. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm Dr. Stephen Goldman. I used to work for the VA, FDA, um, Walter Reed. 
uh, over the last several decades. Maybe we met. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I did think about that coming in. <laughs> no, I was sorry. Plenty of time to talk to you after, frankly. I did want to reiterate two points you make, which are vital. One symptom does not a syndrome make. And when it comes to PTSD, it is made abundantly clear in the DSMs that one has to have a degree of dysfunction to classify something as a disorder. As a matter of fact, many of us have advocated for removing the D from PTSD. And we can talk about that. That's one. Yeah. Secondly, I've got to reiterate the fact that the vast majority of veterans do not experience PTSD. We've learned a tremendous amount. And my career, and my colleague, Dr. Rudolph from NIH, will reiterate this. Our careers span the introduction of PTSD as a discrete disorder in 1980. It was nothing new about the disorder. You could have had it in the Peloponnesian Wars. I do a lot of work. I have a new book out on the Civil War in relation to that. The point is the clarification, which is what you're talking about, and Aaron Beck, the great cognitive behavioral therapist who I still uh, revere, the concept of clarification, explaining to veterans that they're going to have trouble sleeping when they come back from war, the fact that they are not mentally ill, in the experience that they have. You've talked about the power of that, and I did want to reiterate that aspect, because I believe that's what you're getting at. The second aspect is, and forgive me if you th it sounds self-serving from a former VA doc, the cumulative knowledge of the VA of working with veterans for several decades, and the knowledge we have learned over time is applied day after day at the VA, and is now being used in the Department of Defense because what's happened with people going back and forth between the VA's program, the active duty personnel, both of which I've worked. I hope, and again, this is exactly what you do, I know, in the committee, is knowing that we now use things we didn't use before. There are capabilities we didn't have before. There's knowledge we didn't have before. And we don't have to relearn after every war things that we did learn or could have learned 90 years ago in yeah. relation to and that. that's, And really, that's a great point to close on. It keeps coming back to something I say over and over and over again. I think people underestimate when it comes to seeking mental health help the degree to which a fundamental belief in a lot of people that there is no help is a significant, is the biggest impediment, okay? Is that, you know, wait a second, if I'm feeling like this, you know, I just don't want to talk about it because I, there's nothing that can be done about it. No, no, is it? And it's like I was, I, I, I quoted this in a number of articles, but I remember when I was when I first tried. There was a psych, psychiatrist out at uh, Bethesda that I went and saw back in 2005. Didn't work out, but that's fine. Um, and the only thought I, I know it wasn't. Just to be clear, it was not. Um, the, the, the only thought was this: that I remember reading in the Onion. If you were the satirical magazine, are they still around? I think they're still around. And the headline was: Psychiatrist actually cure someone. <laughs> okay, that was the headline. It was such sort of thought of like a national joke that that would be the thing, and that's the way I thought of it. That's really wrong, a hundred percent wrong. Okay, yeah, there there are therapies that can be enormously helpful wherever you are in the spectrum. And then the final point, like you said, there is a point when you are in a clinical anxiety clinical. That's that's a thing, and that certainly needs to be dealt with. But even if you're short of that you can benefit from having a conversation about how better to process the events in your life so that you are better able to function and less stressed out or less depressed. Um, so there's a continuum of care here, but it really it, it is there and you can be helped. And that is not at all, again, to diminish people who have very, very serious problems, who struggle with it. Um, but that continuum exists, help does exist, and it really does make a difference for people. So thank you, I appreciate you sharing those insights. So please give us a second to scoot around to the table out front and please uh, join me in purchasing a book and getting your copy signed. And please thank Congressman Smith along with me for this amazing conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.